Hello everyone. I'm going to discuss in this little short lecture that we have about the applications of AI in education. Well, AI and education, I think, personally, it's something of a late comer, but it really came in with a vengeance. Um, this research started off, personally, when I started my, my PhD uh, some six years ago. And we felt, the, Professor Montebello and myself, that there was a need or a niche that could be exploited. Namely, when one uses e-learning, and there are a lot of flavors of e-learning, um, it was noted that uh, people, the retention of the cohort, people do not um, commit themselves fully to e-learning. There, there was a lot of study that shows um, many universities or institutions went into the business to capitalize uh, on the opportunity, because normally if one, one takes, uh, takes a look, it's the early bird generally that catches the worm. And many universities, especially the, the, the American ones, um, uh, who, who tried to capitalize early on this opportunity, really started um, making material in a one-size-fits-all approach to education. Now, those of us in the field really know that uh, today we are striving to move away from a one-size-fits-all situation. Why? Because we know that all people are different. Okay, in a classroom setting it may be a bit hard even for a teacher who, who is um, physically present with the student, many of the time that will be, um, to adapt, so to speak, to each and every person. Another phenomenon is that as time goes by, we are also noticing that people have a lot of difficulties. I would be a visual learner, the other would be learning from text or books. Somebody would need a combination of both. Um, and the poor teacher would have to literally just adapt. In physical situations, um, uh, you can get learning support educators, which may help individuals or a group of individuals um, to learn in their own way, but again in a class context. But this thing of people being online, um, uh, out of a class context, um, was a bit curious. Why do a lot of people um, subscribe for a course, especially when it would be one of those glamorous professors that would have world fame and would have contributed uh, to a lot within his or her field, so he would be popular? A lot of people, literally times even in the thousands, um, uh, would subscribe to attend the course, but then fewer than a hundred would literally make it to the end. Um, and we started asking a lot of questions. Is it boring? Are we not stimulating people enough to stick right through? Is the material that um, we are pushing forward enough? Is it interesting enough? And time after time, the same things emerged. People, yes, are not being stimulated in the right way. There is also an issue of people attending courses. And one, one of the, the most important thing is the, the crowd factor, so to speak. So I would attend a lesson online and I would not have that um, interaction, interrelationship with my peers where maybe I could go to a library to study and we start to discuss certain problems and look at them in a different way. Or else the teacher would not be physically present where I can ask questions. I'm just left to my own devices. So rather than education 
in itself. I think that these courses were ignoring one thing. It's the physical need, the psychological need as well. The physical need to be present in an environment, the psychological need to be surrounded by peers, by lecturers, by people who can help me out, or else even the need to contribute and help others out, because that can make me feel good. And if I'm feeling good about something, I contribute more. I'm more open. So it was not just a simple thing as, um, you know, fix the way that material is styled and uh, you've got a winning formula. Because if you go to these courses, many, like for instance, I'm just going to name one or two, Udemy, Coursera, um, you see that the material is well organized. And people giving lectures over there about anything you can imagine um, uh, also produce decent, at least very good, video lessons. I, for one, have tried even to experiment on myself by subscribing myself to um, a lot of courses, even what I call hobby courses, but I have never really managed to, to persist in the end. Sort of my commitment waned out. And that even deepened my curiosity about the, the, uh, the phenomenon. So, Professor and myself, we came down to um, an interesting question. Can AI help alleviate this issue a bit? Can we use some sort of AI algorithms that will help facilitate learning? Naturally, the answer to this is yes. It is the how that is really difficult to, to get into place. Now, as I told you in the beginning, six um, years down the line, things really changed, especially in 2020, um, when this pandemic really forced us to look at well, different aspects of life, not just education, in a different way forced us to turn on the tools because life had to go on uh, even though in, in an emaciated way but it had to go on um, and despite that fact we had a lot of tools which were there present we were not using and we started to experience now a lot of life online personally it was comfortable for me I gave a lot of lectures online, I even attended a lot of meetings online, but psychologically it impacted me as well. Mostly because I was not interacting directly with people. Now, why education? Of course, it can be quite a lot of situations, but education is particular. Education is a founding stone of uh, a modern society. Um, uh, even in the Maltese constitution, and I believe there are other countries that have this as well, um, education is considered a right. You have a right to have a roof over your head, to have food, to have a job, even to get educated and to get your children educated. It is a right. So when a country um, um, extends itself in such a way to put education at the forefront, rightly so, um, you cannot underestimate the importance that education gives to a nation in terms of skills that people train, in terms of well-being that people experience because they're more or better knowledgeable the way they argue. So education and its impact on society, on economy, on economics, uh, it cannot be disregarded. Hence, the importance. But, at times you even feel that we take it for granted, which should not be the case. We have to take care of it, and we have to even nurture it quite a lot. Now, I have a long personal experience in educating youngsters, about 15 years now, most of them in full time. <laughs> And I can reliably assess that physical contact 
exchanging is part of human need. In the past, there were many bizarre experiments, unethical, so to speak, where people were purposefully isolated, even in prisons, and the effect noted was devastating. So as humans, as people, we need that contact. So the first thing that came into mind when trying to approach a solution is to approach it from the need of a human, of course, because we people, we live in an environment. The title of the dissertation is Agent Assisted Collaborative Learning. And that was purposeful. Agent Assisted could be a bot, it could be software, whatever, which helps the person or persons learn better. And I use the word collaborative as well because I firmly believe that collaboration is um, a part of learning as well. So it was using technology not to replace, to enhance, to build on whatever we have rather than throwing it away okay one might argue listen um, what we have is not perfect agreed and it will never be but we as humans we are we, we do our best to give whatever we can give to the people around us to improve society to better the situation of life okay so why um, um why do we need to improve because now especially in the situation that we are in globally technology really supported us right through the wave if you look at i think one of the last pandemics 1918 spent about three years there nobody had a clue of what was going on and how to cure it Bear in mind that electron microscopes and viruses were not yet invented. It took some time. Um, so um, isolation was just, just the way to do it. Um, from then on, we see even that distance learning started to gear up. First, people started using post. But again, the engagement is a bit hard. You receive on the learning stuff by post you put your work in write it seal it send it back to be corrected naturally the turnaround time is uh, a bit heavy uh, weeks or months even um, and so you get disconnected then you get radio coming in later on television coming in but both radio and television only transmit in simplex. Why? I receive, but I cannot interact back. Yes, it's good for even creating awareness, but the interaction that takes place in a classroom, it's like a transaction. I give something, I get something. Um, and that makes me feel a bit more human. That makes me feel a bit that, listen, my skill, the skill that I'm trying to achieve with this lesson, lecture, or whatever, is um, um, reaching or giving a benefit to me and even to those around me. Because um, getting a skill um, in more ways than one implies that I could earn a decent living. I may even train other people. It's very common to find that at work. So what was really, what really different, what's really different, sorry, um, is that the approach, sadly, remained the same. But it is the technology that has changed during the years. First, we had books and paper. Practically then, we started posting things around the world. Television and radio then made their own impact. The speed and dissemination levels really um, uh, reduced, yes, even the time to turn around, but we still did not crack um, the one important thing. How do I feel 
that I'm part of something. Yes, I'm attending a university, but no one else around me seems to know or to care. And why is that um, important? Human beings, you know, it's a factor of importance to form part of a crowd. We feel part of a family. Even if you follow um, old um, tribes, when somebody did something wrong, worst punishment, maybe even worse than death, was shunning. Shunning even meant death. And that thing seems to have carried on into life. The important thing now is that, okay, I mean, shunning will not really make an effect now in our society, but psychologically, I think it does make an effect. So, when the internet came in, and technology, even on the internet, took its time, but it really developed well, especially when rich content started to be available, we started to see even a move from courses you can buy and install on your computer, but which are rather sterile, to now massive open online courses, MOOCs, which were just really proliferating through the net, where you can get um, whatever you needed and whatever you wanted to, um, and the course of practically the touch of a button. But again, despite this, um, and I will call it disruptive technology, because at times it takes a bold move to even present new inventions or discoveries to, to the world, it takes courage, because maybe it would not be time as yet. I don't think it was the case in MOOCs. MOOCs really offered and delivered, but the interaction is still not there. It is even a well-known fact that many of the contributors that were supplying the various, the various MOOC um, setups um, with material naturally lend, lent themselves onto their own experience, class delivery. By the way, I need to add something that class delivery could also be um, simplex. I transmit, you receive. Okay, um, as Paolo Freire used to say, even in his book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, good, very good book, um, that education should move away from the banking system, where I have a lot of money and I give it to you. It should be an exchange. Personally, I subscribe to that point of view. Of course, people with different experiences have a lot to offer so i can share my experiences people may take them up may refuse them but even in the process even of the argument people will give me their own experiences when i was younger i could i could remember i still can remember for instance the apprenticeship schemes and and attitudes prevailing at the time so if you wanted to become a mechanic instead of going to school though there were schools you could even join up with somebody who had the skill and you learn on the go that is also a very very good transaction okay it has its flaws i agree it, but it's a very good transaction because you are practically learning by doing it's an exchange in continuation. You may even find out new ways of doing things which even your instructor did not know. You stumbled upon them because you're curious enough. And I think one of the most important attributes of education is curiosity. Now, this led me to, to go quite a bit about and try to understand how do people learn, why do people learn. What drives people to learn? It's not just killing the time, so let's go and learn Spanish or French. Well, of course, that is another one. But 
On the other hand, um, there may be even a serious need. I need this skill because I need a job, for instance. If you go back a couple of years, our country, Malta, needed some reskilling. Manufacturing was slowly dying out, moving to the Far East. And so what do you say to people? Sorry, but I've got nothing for you. No. People then started to be encouraged to go and reskill, and it seems to work. Of course, every so often, every other, um, you know, it's, it's, it's cyclical. I can't say as exactly the time. But there would be disruptive technology or situations which force us out of our um, little nest and to take that move. Of course, the people who do not adapt or who do not adapt quickly will, you know, fall at the bottom half of the curve and they will suffer quite a lot. So it's the need as well, rather than a pleasure. But obviously, anyone can learn even just for the sake of learning. Um, so how do you keep motivation going on? Um, as I said, MOOCs were not really excellent in keeping up motivation. And, you know, they had good content, but it was sterile. Once you get it recorded, once it's there, um, you can't change much. And who is the person, the professor, the lecturer that is teaching me? Maybe I don't even know. The idea behind MOOCs was, well, I think a good idea. Again, the, the, the idea behind it was, listen, let's give everybody a chance. The farmer in Asia, you know, the clerk in Holland and all that. But it did not transcend to that. Only people with even a certain level of education really asked for more. Maybe I'm a computer programmer and I wanted to update my skills, but I don't have the time. Or a lawyer and I need to go into whatever. So MOOCs would really help me, um, you know, um, get my time a bit better, manage my time better, and even um, give me the opportunity to upskill myself. Yes, yeah, that was good. But we aren't keeping any people, as I said. So how does IT really contribute, and AI in particular, to getting people really stuck onto whatever they made. In the real world, maybe many of you can argue, people go to school, at least between certain ages, because you are forced to go to school. And some cleverly try to get around that. But yes, it should not be forced. And I even think that education should be even enjoyable. Yes, enjoyable. I mean, not in the, you know, circus or comedy sort of way, but yes, I'm doing something which is beneficial, and I like doing it. So, how about now trying to bring in um, ideas that really developed and moved on during my little research um, so that we're now starting putting things into a context. So the first thing that started to do is try to understand how people learn. Why? Because first you have to identify the problem. What is the motivating one? Why do people, you know, start off with a lot of enthusiasm and then that falls off? If I did not understand that, then I could not offer really a solution. Okay, so first of all, it would be pressures of um, the, the world around us. I need to reskill. I have some free time. Maybe I'm a pensioner. So I, need, I just want to learn how to do this or the other. Okay, so the motivation comes there, the want, the need. 
But then, how do I learn? There are a lot of theories, all valid, some even as old as a hundred years or more. And we go back to the likes of Piaget, John Dewey, and many more, Paolo Freire, a bit more recently. And everybody would offer, you know, his take on this, that or the other. Yes, okay. And then we have the different intelligences. But I still felt there was something missing. And one thing that then came into me was that um, people use their experiences to learn. Now, what does it mean if I'm learning German, for instance? I don't know anything about German. So at first, because my experience is zero, I do one of two things. I either relate German to some sort of other Teutonic, Anglo-Teutonic language that I know, English, for instance, and I try to bridge, ah, so, okay, this seems to be here and this seems to be there. Because, hypothetically, if I've understood the concept in, let's say, English, okay, so this means that I can even translate that possibly into German. Then, once I've got a foothold on whatever challenge I have, I scaffold on to the next level. So it is as if building. Now, I've seen a lot of experiments, for instance, people wanting to learn, say, Spanish. They were bold enough to uh, go, I've seen as an experiment, two people decided with a very, 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 you know, element, elemental knowledge of Spanish dictionary in hand they agreed to talk on the spanish in between themselves and from the us they decided to spend a couple of months in spain where they talked only in spanish of course the need there because you need to you know eat order at a restaurant or possibly take a job or take a bus hire a taxi to go you know i mean the need is there and that really drove them to depend on their own learning skills. So now learning would, would have become a survival for these people. Um, at the end of the day, in two, three months, these people were fluent in Spanish, which seems to be quite a short time when you consider the time one spends at school to get the rudiments of a language. And the same goes all for practically anything we want to learn. So there was that, you know, motivator. If you don't learn, you're going to suffer, you're going to die. It's not somebody threatening you, but it's a situation you realize. So I started to understand that people rely on their experiences, and then there would be some sort of reason even pushing them to um, get to grips with whatever challenge they put to themselves. Um, there is also, for instance, that interesting experiment uh, made by, I can't remember the name, but the Polgar sisters. Polgar sisters are three women which are very famous, especially two of them in chess, female grandmasters, two of them. And their father decided to see, listen, is it a natural ability or can it be trained? And he started training his daughters in chess. That seems to have worked well. But, but, the daughters liked the game. So there was that sort of motivation and that, that sort of reward you get uh, from learning to have that skill. Um, and as you notice, it is not as simple as offering some sort of algorithm Okay, this is the algorithm, nice, fancy, from now on, you're going to have students that stay with you. No. But the algorithm, whatever, or set of algorithms in this case, would have to be something tuned or um, close to 
what humans really feel and get out of learning, how they enrich their experience at the end of the day. Because learning, after all, helps us enrich our own experience, and we like to share that. So, uh, recapitulating a bit, this would mean that first you have to understand your target area. In my case, this has been how to help people enrich their experience. That's vague, really vague. And one of the things that I found during the course of this um, research, that, okay, we could try to adapt material to, um, to the students' needs. Yes, that would help. Still, it was not enough. So I started defining a little ecosystem. In many schools today, you can find some sort of learning management systems. One of the most common is, I think, Moodle. There are, there are more. I've had some experience with Moodle in the past as a user rather than as an administrator, but largely it was used as a repository for leaving teaching material in place. I found that many students would be even indifferent to Moodle. It would be just a repository for the lecturer to pull down the notes from Moodle and say, OK, this week, this is what we're going to do. And I've came across that many a times in my experience, even teaching um, exclusively Maltese students, even when I taught large classes of international students, Nigerian people mostly. Um, for some reason, the attitude to online material is a bit indifferent. But then, when they come to class, the interaction is interesting. Okay, so, a learning management system on its own is not enough. But that's one of the building blocks you, you, you have to go through. Okay? So, on the other hand, um, I started to see, listen, are there any tools that really could help enhance material or experience? Why? Because if something is pleasurable, I passed my exam, that exhilarates me. Uh, I see that I'm getting on on this new skill, I can um, adapt to it quite well. And that makes me feel good. Of course, that feel-good factor would motivate me to keep on um, practicing so that I get better. And after all, um, you maybe have come across that 10,000 hour rule that they say, listen, to become some world expert in anything, playing the violin, um, you know, an, an athlete, footballer or whatever, you have to spend at least 10,000 hours training at something. What they left out of this equation was 10,000 hours training in what really matters, because I can spend 10,000 hours doing something which is uh, irrelevant or does not help me achieve my goal. I'm going to divide this purposefully, this, this talk purposefully, into two videos. Well, now in the next part, I will um, start discussing even the technical aspect of a possible solution to, to this problem. So we got to training. Now we're going to see how we're going to keep the interest up. So presumably we have a student that knows what he wants or she wants. Um, we have the material to uh, cover whatever skill we need to learn. But now we have to keep him or her interested in achieving the goal that the person set for himself. And that is where AI will come in. I started to hint against the, well, the direction that I tried, in which I tried to find a solution to this problem. Started off by a learning management system like Moodle, 
And then, after some extensive research, I said, listen, um, are there any systems that try to understand our behavior, the way we learn, and they offer us some sort of solution to uh, enhance our experiences? And naturally, this led me to a very, very uh, obvious, but so, so obvious that you don't see it at first place. And that's called the humble recommender system. In essence, what does that do? Mostly used in uh, online shopping environments, um, the recommender system brings back suggestions um, about our, based on our buying patterns, for instance, what we may like and not like. And that struck some sort of interest in me. So, if I can tune, set up a recommender system within an educational environment and help the student by delivering him to him extra material that may help um, him in his studies, that would be fine. So, I started embarking on this lovely journey, I must say. But um, when I started moving and uh, understanding and studying, the case of education is not really um, like buying. I mean, if I go into, say, Amazon, eBay, Netflix, YouTube, I leave some sort of a fingerprint behind me where I can be profiled. Of course, students can also be profiled. But again, um, the Amazon and so forth algorithms are continuously, you know, looking at my behavior. So do we really need to, you know, keep profiling the students continuously? Apart from that, I think at times it even feels uh, like an intrusion on privacy. So maybe, although possible, well, okay, I wasn't there yet. I may have seen land, but I still had um, a considerable hop to move. Recommender systems come in different shapes and sizes, naturally. And when we're looking at recommender systems, um, there are ways you can approach the problem. The two basic approaches to a recommender system would be collaborative filtering, filtering and also similarity indexing. So, in essence, we have to match um, a search with our closest neighbors, hence the AI. So if I'm looking for, you know, some type of product, a pen, um, uh, neighbors to that pen could be, of course, other pens in the business's catalog. And they may tempt me to say, listen, users who bought this normally bought that. And you would notice that it's strikingly um, uh, accurate. Okay, not 100%, but it could, as it even did in my case, many a time hook me on. They use even words, bargain, if you get this and buy that. So, isn't that capturing interest? Isn't that keeping me fueled, literally? I went in to buy a pen and ended up with some converter cartridge, bottle of ink, and possibly even another pen. This accounts for about 40% of the sales of Amazon. And I think that is really, um, really good, yes. So they must have something to it. And we even see Netflix jumping into the bandwagon. Why? Because Netflix, on the other hand, depends on subscriptions. 
and to keep me interested and ultimately renew my subscription when the first one expires, or even possibly tempting me to go on to some higher level of a subscription and spend more, they have to keep my interest there. Otherwise, I just won't do it. Not because I hate Netflix, but I'm not interested. Okay, there are things that you just, that they just don't attract you. So what do they do? They profile me as a client. What does this person like? But that's not enough. Why? Because if they give me the stuff I like, uh, that tends to be a bit finite. So they have to even to jog my interest in things that I might like. So you would even notice that the approach of the algorithms, especially in collaborative filtering, they are not, you know, just one exact pinpoint search as you have in an SQL query. Retrieve this where these conditions are true. It has to be a bit more, you know, fuzzy. It has to be a bit more um, uh, wide. Because there would be things that may have not crossed my mind, but when I see them, well, they, they would excite some interest. My interest in this type of technology was certainly excited, and so I started to move on. Now, collaborative filtering would not depend only on, uh, what's it called, my past history, but I'm also profiled, apart from my preferences to this or that, uh, with other people. Because despite the fact that I would have um, liked this or that, you know, topic, subject, film, item, uh, other people may have similar interests, overlapping interests, but not exactly. So I am sort of lured into looking at something different. Now, the problem would be there, um, how to translate this into education? What about if I don't know anything about the person? So, techniques called like cosine coefficients, uh, similarity or, or ratings from similarities. So, if Mario likes this and Peter likes that, but there are, you know, subtle differences in, uh, you know, our attitudes towards uh, the stuff we tend to like, Maybe I can tempt Peter to take a look at some of the items that Mario is looking at. And that works reasonably well. Um, um, how about, for instance, knowledge-based filtering? I know what the items are. So when client X starts to... Uh, look at these types of clients, fountain pens, for instance, um, I suggest more and more things that would be close to, for instance, a price range that the person is looking at, uh, and items that could be really classified uh, within the same sort of context. So I would know in advance that this object is of this type. This person is looking for, maybe not something specific, but objects of a certain type. Perfume, watches, pens, whatever, books, even books. Okay. Um, so, techniques have, have uh, come into play where we notice that they need some work. And especially in dealing with the cold start problem. Not all techniques would be um, good enough to deal with unknowns. So let's say the student is a new student of mine. Let's say that the student has never learned French or German, so I just don't really know what he's up to, what he really likes. Um, and that could be an issue. One of the things that 
maybe helps to, to go around that would be giving your client, your student, your uh, whatever your, your target is, you're, you're attracting um, some sort of preliminary questionnaire. So at least you can um, uh, ease getting out of the cold start problem. Because at least now I know what subjects do you like? What type of learning method do you prefer? Um, uh, do you really need a lot of revision? Or help? Would you like so that you would be grouped with students with similar, um, uh, whatever, sim similar attributes as you are? And all that could be very, very fine when it comes to dealing with um, people buying. Because we do not mind being helped, maybe. But when this thing extends itself even onto um, students, we're delving closer and closer into the realm of privacy issues. So even if you're conducting research, make sure that you do not violate any, any uh, privacy issues of students or whoever you are studying. So as I said, recommendations will take a lot of form. Okay, there would be the typical classes and cases. You are not obliged to, I mean, stick to that. Of course, things would follow a pattern because um, uh, they seem to work. Of course, patterns then have even their own issues because at times we grow fond of them and when those change, we find it a bit hard to change, if ever. If ever. So, one of the first steps would be how can I adapt um, proven technology, in this case a recommender system, to um, um, educational purposes. One way of doing it is using a recommender system to help students find material. That would work well, just as if a person was um, buying something. So I'm looking about, you know, whatever planet there is, and this thing would just start suggesting things, uh, more information to, to me, where I can at least enrich myself. That would be one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is going back to the um, learning management system, watching the behavior of students, examining it, and mimicking a good teacher when he sees students struggling with certain subjects. He may suggest tutorials, for instance, so you know you have that sort of breakout. You add that human element, I'm caring for you, and you start giving the student better exercises which are tuned to their ways of understanding and working. And that is one of the things which really interested me most. So you get feedback from an LMS, typically what type of subject did the student go back to, how much time did he spend on that subject, and if he's continuously revisiting that subject, which would mean there are some difficulties there. So a recommender system could um, get that data, translate that data into preference, because if I spent time in this or that area within a software, um, an LMS software, that means that for some reason I need to be there. And so the recommender system would really push back to me um, items which are um, which are necessary. Now, like any other software, the main goal of a recommender system is to be as close as possible to the goals that I, as a user, am um, trying to get. There have been cases where 
behavior on Amazon led algorithms to suggest certain products which at first I thought I did not need. So it seems to be as if my behavior um, was being interpreted in such a way that, for instance, I'm trying to, let's say, uh, study a new language. So I'm looking about, researching a bit about books on that language. Or else if I have even a deeper problem with verbs in French, for instance, which used to be a nightmare for me when I was younger, that thing would probably suggest, listen, this is the best place you, should, you could go to because a lot of people do that and they seem to be satisfied when they had the same problems you have. And that would really help us in, 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 the, in the very sense of the word. But again, giving me um, enough information and displaying it in such a way as it makes it attractive, interactive, colorful, um, explained in such a way that I could relate to it and scaffold on my own experiences is not the complete journey. There is still another step that one has to take and which is the biggest issue maybe of it all. And after we suggest uh, material and stuff to the user, the last and important step is how to enrich that material in such a way as to engage the student. So notice it's a process. It's a process that builds on needs and wants. It's a process that lends itself to a lot of attributes and tools that we have in our possession. And well, what's wrong with that? After all, um, it's used in different ways. If we look at marketing, for instance, the way that uh, the marketers try to attract our attention is by making us think, for instance, that we need this product or that product because it will make our life better. In the case of education, yes, we have to still to well market uh, that education will be good for you, um, but not in the sense as medicine, you know, it's generally, it's generally a bit more painful. But yes, because at times results will not be apparent immediately. To learn French, German, whatever, takes me time till I am competent enough that I can hold a conversation with someone. Um, and even if it's a game, to learn the rules and the techniques of a game will take me time till I become proficient. But the process of becoming proficient has to help me, guide me or scaffold me to move even forward um, to assist me in my journey towards learning French, for instance. And one of the things that I found out is the need for better explanations. If you go into a recommender system, let's take the one Amazon, Netflix or YouTube offer, they do tell me, listen, we've got suggested videos for you. They don't tell me why. They don't even ask if I can disagree. This is what we've got, because we thought you are interested in whatever, buying fountain pens. So I just am pelting you with this. And at times too much information can even scare us away. Because you say, listen, I mean, do I have to go through all this? So the next step is to humanize whatever output the recommender system is giving me is giving me i do not depend completely on it okay it really narrows down my target area into such a place where it makes it manageable it does the heavy lifting for me instead of me having go out and try to find alternatives a recommender system would be 
closer to to home what I'm needing now. Um, so it could even anticipate, and at times yes, they managed to anticipate um, uh, something that maybe never crossed my mind. Now, can you imagine that in education? I'm learning physics, I'm learning French, and this thing is noticing from my behavior that I have problems with a certain aspect of the language or, or, or my physics. And so it starts pushing up exercises, uh, or even better information, um, which maybe could help me move on. But notice I'm still alone. When something in a recommender system is pushed back to me, um, I can't relate much to that. Okay, I'm looking for a book about whatever. And similar titles crop up. And I start looking at reviews. But it's still something, you know, you feel alone. Explanation, on the other hand, when you start enhancing the information that is given, and not by adding more information to it, but making it more palatable, making it more acceptable. I start feeling that I am like in a dialogue. So that starts to become different now, because it's not only that a machine is giving me suggestions, but now it starts making things a bit more clear. Possibly I could even um, discover new information about that. Possibly it could even help me increase curiosity, because I think curiosity is a very, very good part of education. You fire your student up. Okay, so, when I started then moving down the line of explainable AI, um, I started reaching the edge of the forest and moving into a desert or uncharted territory. Explaining is not easy. Even for us human and humans at times, you explain a concept to somebody and the guy just doesn't get it. He feels frustrated. We can attribute that, okay, the guy is simple, he does not have much experience maybe. So naturally, as a good teacher or a good friend, I have to lower down my expectations and try to help the other one on the other side, the person on the other side, come up to the level that maybe even he wants to come up. It is not a question of superiority or inferiority, mind you. It's a question of upscaling the skill of a person. Okay, so when you start playing chess, for instance, um, your skills would be a bit rudimentary. By time, you start improving, playing a better game. So how do you do that? Principally by playing against people, sharing your experiences, and you're learning as you go. But the basis would have to be there. A machine could do that by enhancing the or enriching the content it's giving to people. The first thing that I noticed while going down this road um, that there is also legal pressure now being forced on us. The EU gives people to its GDPR, Recital 7, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, its GDPR regulation um, that people have a right for an explanation. Why? Because it's not only education that is being serviced by AI. I can have a loan. Let's say I have a loan. I go into the um, website of a particular bank. There's a bot and it tells me, listen, I can give you a quotation or some sort of feedback within minutes. And I say, okay, that's good because it saves me going to the bank and being refused. At least I have some idea. It's not enough telling me, sorry, sir, but we can't give you a loan. It may be correct, but where does that leave me? Why 
don't you give me a loan. The algorithm gave me an answer. And by all chances, that thing is correct. It may be correct. But I need to know why. And to come to answering why is not easy. It's not easy because um, uh, we people tend to be a bit complex. We've got feelings. At times even feelings are irrational. Why do I like pens and not pencils? Why do I support this team and not that team? It's sort of an emotional sort of thing, so I have to um, access that as well. So apart from legal pressures, because at times the legal pressure is there, because um, it would be noted that um, uh, we cannot or we don't want to give explanation, because explanations are hard. So when we come to an explanation, I said, listen, how can we give an explanation to people? And there are attempts uh, to come to some sort of explanation, even successful attempts, but frankly speaking, I didn't like much, because many of them focused on um, explaining how the algorithm works. The way I reasoned it is, let's say I want to go back to the loan example. Let's say I want to take a loan. I mean, I don't really care how the algorithm works. What I care is how it came to its conclusion. Its conclusion. I did not give you a loan because you have a credit score of X. And X is below our threshold of acceptance. Now, if I agree to that or not is another thing. But now I know why. And that's better for me. So how can I now translate this gap into um, some sort of reasonable feedback? And at first I said, OK, so I have to have some sort of body of knowledge somewhere where the students could, you know, interact. I try to understand what is troubling them and give some feedback which, you know, eggs them on. The first thing that came into mind was um, a database and getting an algorithm to search through. But believe it or not, when you start using SQL, SQL is beautiful, but it is a bit rigid because the main um, rationale behind SQL is to retrieve information in a way that I, as a person, could make some use of that. But what it gives me is exactly what I'm asking it to give me. Who are the people aged over 75 living in this area? Are there any people who, you know, are expats that are whatever? What do these people usually buy? What's my product, the most popular product? What are the products that don't move? SQL is just good for that. But in explaining, um, people even expect some fuzziness to the answer. Not incomprehensible, but not precise either. To give you enough room to, to uh, wiggle through, to give you enough room to um, feel that there is something more you have to achieve, not definite surgical, you know. And to that, I discovered something even relatively newer on the database scene, graph databases. Now, with graph databases, I could put facts inside them and I could have relationships between those facts as part of the data. So when it comes to explaining things, I can tell you, listen, Mario likes ice cream. Peter sells ice cream. So you can easily deduct that Mario could probably know Peter. 
and Mario likes ice cream because he also is a friend of Peter. Or he is a friend of Peter because ice cream, you know, made some sort of common deduction. And that would really be enriching whatever I like as an ice cream. There could be different flavors, different companies, different attributes. And I think the possibilities are limitless. Really limitless. Why? Because now we have introduced into the um, equation not the rigidness at times that IT puts on us, which is fine for, I think, 80% of the situations where we have business applications that require specific answers. It is as if it's out there somewhere, but I don't know. I just type in the keywords and it gives them back to me. But now it also gives me um, some sort of um, flexibility that I can add on to it. I can scaffold. I can add to my experience. I can even say, oh, okay, so how is ice cream is made? Uh, okay, so there's this company and that one and the process is this and the ingredients are that. I can say, listen, are there any flavors? So I'm trying to even get on to new um, bits of information which even help my understanding or experience of ice cream, not just by eating it, for instance, or buying the product. Um, so I can take it to any level. So this is what my take on using, well, an agent and even existing technology to enhance education. So I started off with understanding how people learn, came to the conclusion that we use as human beings our experiences. So even when we delve into the unknown, which is very common, but we um, use the foundation of what we've learned and experienced in the past so that it will help us face the future. So if I'm looking at, say, a chess problem which I haven't solved or faced in the past, but I can use my experience to attempt that. I may not solve it right away, but after a number of tries, I yes, I may get through that. And to make that available, in my opinion, precise information is not enough. It is not enough to tell me, listen, you can move the knight in such a way in chess. What is enough is let me experiment. Give me your experience so that I can build upon it and add to it. So it's flexibility, something which is fluid, which moves from person to person. In our case, it moves from agent, a system, to a person. And the result would be keeping me interested. I hope that this short little two-part lecture um, excited you about the realm of AI and its possible use, especially in education, the benefits it even gave me to try and understand things around me and express them in a way to offer solutions. Um, and hopefully I could have been of help to any one of you embarking on this beautiful um, dimension of curiosity, how to solve problems and how to use tools from different domains to come down to a solution, to stretch knowledge even further. Thank you very much.